Chat with Traders, episode 125. This is your key to the minds of trading's elite performers, those who profit in relentless markets. Here on the Chat with Traders podcast, you'll hear about the skill sets and tactics that lead winning traders to win so you can level up and become a better trader. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. What's up? Welcome, everybody, to another installment of your favorite traders' favorite podcast, Chat with Traders. I'm kidding, people. Just having a laugh, but welcome nonetheless. With me on this episode 125 is Matthew Hoyle. Matthew was once a trader, or more specifically, an options market maker, and he started at a very young age on the exchange floor in Amsterdam. But since 2003, he's been in the headhunting, or otherwise known as recruiting business. His firm is Matthew Hoyle Financial Markets. So what he does is he finds the best candidates for hard to fill roles. He's contracted by banks, hedge funds, and all sorts of trading firms. For example, just to name a few, Tibra, Optiva, Tower Research, Citadel, Millennium Partners, amongst many others. Needless to say, Matthew's super knowledgeable on the industry and he's won many awards for doing what he does. During this episode, we get talking about tips for getting hired, the skills which are most in demand and what firms are looking for, also how firms attempt to attract and retain talent, various compensation structures, and everything in between. Let's jump right to the meat of this episode, coming to you from Hong Kong, here is Matthew Hoyle. American rule of law and all that. I mean, it's good. Good stuff, man. Well, if you don't mind, bring us up to speed on your days prior to being a recruiter. What's your background? My background, um, I actually started as the, the youngest options market maker in the history of the exchange in Amsterdam. So this is back in the days when it was open outcry trading, so the stripy jackets and we were all standing around on the trading floor. Uh, so I went to school in, in the Netherlands and I, I did secondary school, something which was called uh, gymnasium, which is basically the highest level of secondary school that you can do. So that includes um, ancient Greek and Latin. Uh, then at age 18, I got a double offer to go to LSE, but because I started trading options at the age of 13 and had done rather well, I figured it might be a better idea to go and work on the exchange, much to the disappointment of my parents and my teachers. And lo and behold, I, I, I got a job offer, so I took it. That was a, a lot of fun. Did that for six years. Uh, was there when 9-11 happened, um, all kinds of stuff. You know, it was, um, it was definitely a very formative time of my life. Um, I also got to work with the founders of, of very well-known firms like Optiva and, and IMC and Flow Traders. All those guys were on the trading floor with us. Um, you know, the founder of Capstone, for example, Paul Britton, he'd come over from London. Duncan Valentine is one of the partners. There. All those guys. So it was, um, they, it was a very, very interesting time. Um, the exchange went electronic in 2003. Of course, I didn't have a university degree because I insisted to go and work there and be the youngest. <laughs> so I had the choice to either go, to, go back to university and study, um, or go to Chicago and continue doing open outcry trading. I didn't think that was a good idea because it was clear that it was a subset industry. Uh, or do something else entirely, and it wound up being the latter. So that, that's how I wound up in recruitment, actually, by accident. Okay. And did oh, I hear you correctly? Did you say Duncan Valentine? Isn't he one of the um, the dragons on Dragon's Den? That's a different Duncan Valentine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Duncan Valentine I'm talking about is the global head of uh, marketing and capital raising for Capstone. Right. I was going to say, I didn't think he was a trader. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, I, I'm sure he does trade trade, trade something, but it's, um, it's not the things that we trade, no. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you made an interesting point. You said that it was, it was quite a disappointing decision for you to go and trade on the floor like your parents and your teachers were, were disappointed with that decision of yours how come was being a trader sort of looked down upon in some ways 
No, it, um, quite frankly, it, it really wouldn't have mattered what I'd gone off and done. The disappointment had everything to do with the fact that I had been offered two spots at a world-class university and turned them down. That's where the disappointment came from. It came from me not going to university. Okay, okay. So you worked six years on the floor as an options market maker, and then from there you became a headhunter, a recruiter. How did that come about? I had done quite well on the trading floor. Um, you know, we, we got paid rather a lot of money. It was sort of like the last stop of the gravy train before it closed. So I, I bought some real estate in, in the Netherlands, and after the floor closed, I, I took some time off to decide what, what to do next. So I had the offer to go to Chicago. And um, another guy in the same building was actually a headhunter. He, he was doing sales and, and marketing and also technology, which I, I, to this day I still find a very odd combination. Um, but he had been very successful but felt that his employer wasn't paying him enough. So we went down to the pub one day, which was conveniently located opposite the apartment building. And he told me he wanted to start his own business in executive search and asked me if I wanted to help him do it. And I said, well, since I'm not doing anything else at the moment, why don't I, uh, why don't I have a look at that? And that, that's how I rolled into it. I mean, it was actually uh, purely by accident. I mean, if you, we used to get called by, by headhunters, even on the trading floor and back in the open outcry days all the time. You know, we would always tell them to get lost, which in hindsight was a bit foolish. Um, one thing I, I certainly would tell your, your listeners is that if a headhunter calls you, do listen to what they have to say. Don't just hang up the phone straight away. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. Um, if, if, if someone had told me that I would become a headhunter when I was a trader, I would have laughed, and if they had insisted that they were serious, I would have felt insulted. Uh, although, as things turned out, I, I've actually done a lot better out of this than I ever did out of trading, and I, I certainly wasn't a bad trader. You know, I mean, uh, we got paid seven figures US back then. Wow, wow, okay. That, that's really good money, especially for um, however many years ago that was. So, just to set the scene here, put this in your own words. I mean, I know it's pretty self explanatory, but. What is your role as a headhunter today? Like, what do you do? Like, how do you describe your your job? Okay. Our job, it, it's really quite straightforward. We match um, candidates to employers. The driving force behind that is always the employer. So, uh, we are contracted by employers, you know, firms such as uh, Citadel, Tower Research, Optima, IMC, Tibra, all, all these kinds of guys. Um, to to go and find individuals for uh, hard to fill roles, mostly um, that that's very much the executive search part, which tends to be the higher end of the business. Um, recruitment, which is more volume driven and tend to be lower end roles, not less interest, not less interesting, but um, you know roles which are perhaps more common, things like junior trader type positions, you know, or entry level technology roles. You know, we, we also do that, but that, that's the difference between recruitment and executive search. So we do both, and then across all the different market verticals within, within that finance and trading sector. There's a common misconception, which is that we find people jobs. Now, we, we don't get paid by candidates, uh, so we, we don't go around looking for jobs for people. Um, yeah, a lot of people do seem to labor under that misapprehension, but that, that, that's certainly not the case. Now, that being said, um, I have been known to, to put people into jobs even if I didn't have the mandate and didn't get paid for it simply because it was the right thing to do. Uh, you know, this is a business of building long-term relationships which, which need to be lasting and you need to think about that rather than about where the next paycheck is going to come from. Okay. And so, why do these firms come to you? Why do they not deal with this sort of thing internally like in-house? Well, on the lower end of the spectrum, so most graduate recruitment is done in-house these days. Um, you know, I mean, we're also not set up to go and do the milk rounds at the universities and whatnot. Uh, so generally, we we get contracted to, to do the more experienced hires. Uh, the reasons that they approach us are, are several. I mean, we sit on a database of well over half a million people, right, which is a lot more than, than all of our clients put together, which number close to about 100 in that space. Um, we also are quite well known in the market. So what that means is that, that when good people become available, they're quite often the first port of call because they know that we have a very, very good overview as to what's happening in the markets in terms of employment, 
who's hiring, who's not, who's expanding, who's growing into different areas. You know, um, for example, if someone is, is an, uh, an energy trader, you know, I mean, that person might be interested in, in knowing which derivative trading firms are interested in moving into the energy space, right? So they can go there and set up a desk and they might be able to get better terms. So all those kinds of things, you know, I think also the fact that I used to be a trader does set us apart uh, massively from the competition. I mean, there's a couple of recruitment and executive search firms out there which are run by former brokers. Now, you know, with all due respect to the brokers, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget them calling us up, you know, the traders, and they were simply just making things up, you know, now, <laughs> just to try and get a trade done. And unfortunately, there are also people in our industry that do that. Um, that, that ranges from posting non-existing job ads to all kinds of other shenanigans. Uh, we don't do any of that. So we, we really pride our, our reputation, um, which we worked hard for. I, I think all those things, um, contribute to, to why these companies choose to go with us. And the fact that we've got so many customers and have been doing this since 2003, I think is, um, it is proof that what we do works. And what sort of trading operations do you work for? Like, who do you hire for? I know you mentioned a few names before, but what sort of um, trading operations are these? Like, obviously, prop firms, hedge funds. Is there anyone else that you work with as well? Yeah. Okay, so so within the hedge fund domain, um, we do pretty much everything, right? So... This ranges from multi-strategy hedge funds, so you know, which have a multi-manager type of approach. So think of firms like Millennium, for example, or, or, or Citadel, um, you know, all sorts of firms like that globally. So this is across all strategies. So this can be from equity long short through to um, you know equity events, that type of thing, systematic type of strategies, you know, stat arb, uh, index arbitrage. But also long short credit, um, distressed debt, special situations, convertible bond arbitrage, capital structure arbitrage, and there's CTA type strategies. You know, it's, it, it really is a, a very mixed sort of bag. I, I find that highly interesting actually because I, I really enjoy talking to different traders who, who tr- trade different products and different strategies as do all my staff because people love talking about stuff that they that they're good at and that they enjoy, right? So it's always a pleasure listening to these guys. Then within the the prop trading universe, you know, there's uh, a shrinking number of more manual prop trading firms. Um, we don't really hire for arcades, uh, you know, where, where people bring their own money. Um, although a lot of arcades are actually also uh, doing some automated type trading. I mean, if you look at certain companies like RGM Advisors, you know, down in Texas, I mean, these guys came out of an arcade, for example. Um, you know, Baliazny, the hedge fund that spun out of Schoenfeld. I mean, that, that used to be an arcade as well. So the, I, I, I certainly wouldn't write them off. Um, but you know, the, the prop exes of this world, uh, are certainly not, not our main customers. You know, they tend to go and find their own people. So, uh, further within that, that proprietary tra- trading sphere, uh, some firms are entirely automated, um, you know, or, or quickly going that way. Others still have a, a degree of manual type trading, um, or maybe they use things like auto hedging, you know, or stuff like electronic eye and whatnot. So we, so we cover all that. That's pretty much all products. So not just equity linked or equity options, you know, index options, that kind of stuff. It, it really is the whole gambit. I mean, we have clients that also trade things like crude and electricity and you know, all sorts of other jazz. Then the, the last category, which, which you didn't mention is the banks. Now, for the you know the last few years, of course, the banks haven't exactly been very active in the proprietary trading universe. Uh, now, with with Trump and his henchmen rolling back Dodd Frank, I do think that there is going to be a push back into prop trading. Now, now, that's a good thing, I suppose, because banks are generally less picky than the hedge funds and the prop trading firms. It's also a slightly different style of trading, right? And I, I'm, I'm still quite curious, and I think it remains to be seen how many former bank prop traders will, will be successful in the new sort of bank prop environment where there's less or no flow and, you know, you, you have less advantages. But that that is also another another area of interest. Um, you know, and then th- there are certain exceptions where, where brokers, you know, or especially in the U.S., broker dealers also have some proprietary trading activities. 
Um, you know, even Cantor trades some prop as well, which most people don't know. You know, so that that's another area that we look at. Uh, Exan, you know, the um, the French broker, which is owned by BNP Paribas. That's another example. You know, although that's um, th- that's not a very large part. And then another area is is actually fintech type companies, uh, firms that have come out of places like Silicon Valley, or to to a lesser extent, you know, out of, out of some of the Beijing uh, development areas. There, you know, where you've got firms like Google and whatnot. You know, so some of these companies which are really technology driven and have built great technology solutions uh, are now also branching out into the the trading world. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's a fantastic company in Moscow called Artificial Intelligence Management that has you know sixty uh, quants and, and developers, you know, all doing machine learning stuff like that, but they don't have any traders. So you know, companies like that also approach us looking for people that that, that have strategies that they can implement on their platform. Just going back to one of the words you used, you described some prop firms as arcades. Now, I know that's a slang word and some people are probably not really understanding what you're saying there. Can you just clarify what you mean when you describe a a prop firm as an arcade? Okay. All right. Well, well, let's first of all start off with with what is a prop firm, right? A proprietary trading firm trades its own capital. Um, An arcade, on the other hand, uh, they ask you to bring your own money to the table which basically acts as a, a first loss type of principle, right? So if, if you take $100,000 Aussie or US dollars of your own money to, to an arcade, they'll let you employ leverage, um, but the first $100,000 that you lose is your own, right? And you can't lose any more than that. So they're not actually taking any risk on you. They, they basically facilitate you. Uh, and there's also very little training involved. So... So basically, they they act a bit like a glorified broker. Okay. Now, moving on a little bit, I want to talk to you about actually sort of getting a job in the industry. So, you know, I've heard firsthand about some firms, they get like a thousand plus applications when they advertise for uh, a certain job coming up. How do employees filter these? And I guess, um, I don't know how relevant that this question actually is to specifically what you do but i mean i'm sure you're very familiar with the process like how do employees filter through so many like thousands (laughs) or thousand plus applicants like how do they do that well i wish i could say otherwise but quite often the answer is they don't (laughs) which is another reason they come to firms like ours i i i mean i think it's good for a moment, just to consider why you know employers receive thousands of applications. The, the reason this happens is that a lot of people and you know job seekers are inclined to apply for the jobs they want and not the jobs that they're qualified to perform. Now that that's a surefire way to to to, to, to basically not get invited for an interview, right? So. Um, yeah, you know, I've seen people apply to every single job that we posted, right? Whether it was, you know, it could have been toilet cleaning lady or something, right? And they would have applied to that as well, as well as a trading job. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that that's not a good way to go about things. Um, yeah, you know, so that that's one thing. So I've, I would say that don't apply for stuff that you're not qualified for, um, because it's going to make everyone's life easier. Now, you know, of course, yes, that there still are loads and loads of applications. Um, Right now, a lot of our customers also use software to help with this process. They use tools like Greenhouse, for example. You know, these are are HR CRM type systems. Um, Think of it a bit like Salesforce, but then for for recruiting and for CVs, right? Others use platforms like Bullhorn Staffing. You know, so these these tend to manage the, the flow somewhat. Yeah, so then basically you're talking to a computer, right? So what does the computer look at? It's going to look at education. It's going to look at grades, you know, especially for, for, for fresh grad types of roles, right? It really hard sort of quantifiable things. You know, we, we have certain customers that will only hire from certain schools, for example, right? Now, for the more experienced hires, that all goes out of the window. And then the computers have a much, much harder time interpreting uh, experience on a CV, right? So you, you really need humans to look at that and and make a judgment call now that that does become more difficult 
Although in practice, it's not the senior jobs which receive a thousand applications. It's the junior ones, right? Because everyone's eager to go out and get a, a get a job and then just applies for everything. Now, this is probably more applicable to the junior positions that come up as well. Is prior trading experience often seen as a good thing or as a disadvantage? And the reason I ask this question is because I know a guy who used to work at Hull Trading and he was in charge of the hiring and firing there. And one of the things he said to me was that if you applied for a job and you had prior trading experience, in most cases, you'd be disregarded just because of that. You know, they wanted people coming into their firm who had no sort of uh, biases or no uh, preconceptions about how to trade so that they could sort of train them to how they wanted them to trade, if that makes sense. Can you add to that? Is there anything which you have, you know, observed whether prior trading experience is a good or potentially a disadvantage? It's very true that, that a lot of our customers want to hire fresh grads. Um, and this is not just for trading roles, right? I mean, there are certain companies such as Virtu, for example, who won't hire anyone with any experience within the financial sector. This includes technologists, which of course are, are also a big area not to be overlooked. Um, you know, that, there are some good reasons for that. Uh, one of which you you mentioned yourself. It, it's easier to train people without any preconceptions. Um, you know, it, it, it it's more difficult to go and find out where the gaps in someone's knowledge are. You know, it, uh, it's easier just to sort of start from scratch. Now, that that being said, I've always felt that it is certainly a good thing to show an interest in trading. Now, this is something else than prior trading experience within a company, right? I mean, what I love to see in a, um, a junior sort of CV is uh, someone who might have, have written a computer program to do some, some trading uh, whilst at university, you know, or who may have gone on one of these, the, these crowdsourced type of platforms like Quantopian. Quantopian is a, is a good example of that. Um, or CloudQuant, you know, I mean, that, that's a similar one owned by Kirshner. Uh, WorldQuant also have a platform like that, you know, or who may have uh, competed in contests organized by Timber Hill, which was the um, uh, the proprietary and market making division of, of Interactive Brokers that's been closed now. Uh, or DRW also organized competitions like that, you know, so, so, so anything which is trading related that demonstrates a keen interest in trading and technology, uh, you know, and more specifically algorithmic trading. All of that kind of stuff is is very interesting. I mean, what what that can also be is maybe someone who who, who wrote a computer program to play poker, for example, right? So prior experience and interest in are often confused, but they are very different things, right? Um, having prior experience trading, what I will say is this: if you can also program, that's generally going to overcome any issues. Uh, which may arise because you already have experience trading, right? I mean, not all customers will accept that, but a lot of them will. You know, so it's it's not the end of everything, and there are ways to counter it. I do think that, you know, whatever way you cut it, showing an interest in, in, in trading and trading automation and all these kind of things, I, I think that's absolutely key. Yeah, okay. Now, that, that makes perfect sense. Um. This might be a bit of a broad question and you may have already sort of hinted at the answer um, already, but what skills are you noticing which are most in demand as of late? That's a very good question, Aaron. It's, um, it's a bit of a moving target, right? So back in my day, it was uh, very strong arithmetic skills, right? Uh, the, this is even still apparent in the tests which companies like Optiva and IMC and Maven Securities, you know, and Acuna, you know, all, all these Optiva spin outs and then Tibra uh, also administer. You know, I mean, you, you basically have to do a hell of a lot of mental arithmetic in a short period of time. And it's, it's not designed to actually test your ability um, in terms of math or anything like that because they're not hard. It's just a lot in a short period of time. It's actually more like a stress test, you know. So, so back in the day, I mean, anyone with a PhD in physics, for example, would fail that, right? Because they just weren't used to doing that. 
So, so people would need to practice it. Um, that there's some great programs out there for that, like TraderTest.org, for example. You know, I mean, this is run by by a guy who works at Optiva. Um, you know, if if you go on that and and and, and use it to practice, don't don't give them your CV. You should send it to us instead. <laughs> you know, so so. That that was one thing. Then, as as time progressed, you know, obviously technology skills became more and more important. Um, and that started off with with Python and, and scripting languages, and then C plus plus became more important. Um, you know, Java was for a short period. I mean, that's that's not something I would really bother with now. But I I think that that all these things are still relevant, right? So it becomes a little bit like a um, uh, uh, a collection of things, right? So. Yes, you need to be able to perform under stress. You need good arithmetic and mathematics skills. Um, you need to be able to, to script. Um, you need to know some programming, ideally in C++. Uh, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. I mean, VBA and MATLAB just won't cut it. Um, but now, to make matters even more interesting and complicated, something that we get asked to look for a lot is you know things like statistics and then specifically people doing machine learning and that's now also moved on to sort of deep learning um you know using bayesian methods and uh, and all that jazz so i think that as as time progresses the demands go up and up and up right um trading becomes more more competitive uh, it, it's harder to extract alpha to find edge to to find opportunities uh so it really is a mix of all of these things i I don't think you can say that there is any one single thing that you need. I would say that you ideally need all of them. Now, I know a lot of the hand traders are going to be sort of a bit frustrated with that answer. So, let me ask you this question. For someone who just wants to be a point and click trader, right, they have no desire to code, are there still positions that they could be looking for if they actually wanted to get a job in the industry instead of just being an independent trader? Well, I mean, point and click traders generally tend to go in 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 one of three directions, right? I mean, some of them have evolved into absolutely enormous discretionary macro traders. You know, think Paul Tudor Jones, for example, right? Um you know, so that, I mean, that really is taking punts on absolutely everything. It's all discretionary. I mean, that, that's very much a point and click game. Others became very, very large in, in certain products. Um, you know, there was a certain Swiss gentleman named, uh, Paul Rotter, for example, that, that a lot of the manual traders may, may remember. He lived in Singapore for a while. I, I think he just moved actually. He's gone somewhere else now. You know, so, but, but those guys tend to generally retire. And then there's the category that, and decide that they're going to go out and hire people who can code and try and translate their ideas into automated trading. Now, there's been some uh, some very, very successful examples of that happening, right? Because I I have a lot of respect for, for manual traders who've been in the markets for a long time because they know their markets inside out. They know those beasts and those products, you know, like no one else does. And that's something that the quants really still can't compete with. Now, I think the trick is being able to to sort of download that knowledge and, and finding ways to automate it or at least partially automate it. Although I think in practice, a lot of manual traders do do some automated spreading and all, all kinds of stuff like that. You know, so that that is also another path to go. So I that's generally what I see in the market. Does that answer the question? It does, yeah. And are you seeing these things just because of the sort of firms that you work with? You know, you typically... S- tend to lean towards working with more quant-driven uh, firms and, and, you know, different operations? Or do you think that's just, you know, a generalization of the entire sort of spectrum? No, I, th- I, I think that the whole industry is shifting more and more towards automation. I mean, you know, the, the explosion of algo trading in countries like India and China has been very noticeable, right? Uh, you know, so I think that, that for people doing purely manual trading unless they're absolutely huge you know so think you're running several billion dollars sort of classic hedge fund kind of style uh i think that the 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 market is is becoming increasingly difficult unless they have some sort of special edge right i mean think like that guy in japan for example you know that nobody knows who he is but makes hundreds of millions of bucks (laughs) i mean that kind of stuff but when i speak to to very experienced 
manual traders, you know, the, uh, the arcade types of guys. I mean, so, some of these are guys that I used to work with, right? They used to be options market makers. I mean, very, very bright guys, and, and they tended to go down that route. You know, it seems that every year they they, they make a bit less money. Um, you know, and I ask them why that is, and they say, well, it just becomes tougher. You know, and then of course that there are outlier years like 2008 when everyone makes a killing, right? Or 2015 in China. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that in general, uh, that that type of, of trading and business is going to become more and more difficult. Just jumping in here to give a quick mention for our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. If you're a small business owner, then you absolutely got to try FreshBooks. It's going to save you a whole lot of time when handling your taxes and it makes things dead easy to track cash flow or in trader speak, track the P&L of your business. Essentially, FreshBooks is the cloud accounting software that's made for people who want to spend as little time as possible doing their taxes. It's everything you need to stay completely zen come tax time. For a free 30-day trial, all you need to do is go to freshbooks.com slash traders. Then in the how'd you hear about us section, enter the code traders. Again, to try FreshBooks free, visit freshbooks.com slash traders and use the code traders in the how do you hear about us section. So let's say someone in, let's say a junior position or someone looking for a junior role. I know that's not your specialty, but is looking to go into a quantitative prop firm. What are some of the common roles that are out there? Because I know there's, you know, there's many different roles that someone can go into. You know, someone's not just an algo developer. There's, there's, many pieces in the machine that kind of <laughs> yeah make the firm operate like what are some of the some of the sort of roles that a junior might be able to look for well it depends what what you want to do really right and i i would preface the, the answer by saying that certain companies have a very strict segregation between technology and trading such as optiva for example you know, so if you get hired within the technology division as, uh, you know, either doing IT infrastructure or software development, uh, you won't be able to transition into trading later. Other companies do allow that. Uh, IMC is an example of that, for example. So, you know, that th- those are things that I, I, I would consider. Um, now, most of the large companies do have what, what essentially amounts to a traineeship, right? Either within technology or trading. Uh, regardless of whether or not they they do allow that crossover, so th- those are certainly things that I would look at. They tend to be the uh, companies that that find their origins in Europe. Some of the big U.S. companies take a somewhat different approach, right? So um, the, the ones who are less into the options markets but more into, into Delta One type products. So so think Virtu, for example. So they say that you know absolutely everyone, uh, regardless of what they've what degree they've got, right? If it's a bachelor's, a master's, or a PhD, it has to start completely at the bottom and basically starts in administration because they really need to understand how the system works all the way through, right? I mean, a company like Versu has a hard cap of 150 employees globally, which is quite incredible considering that they, they, they make nearly as much money as some companies that have five times that many employees, right? So, you know, that, that that's a different type of approach, more a more integrated one. Yeah, that there's various various options. I think that it it really kind of depends what environment you want to be in. And yeah, I, I sort of alluded to that by by talking about the the differences between several firms, right? I mean it really is it, it's a difficult thing because coming straight out of university, you know, and looking at these junior types of roles, I mean obviously most students wouldn't know the differences between all these firms. But the differences are, are very, very significant. I mean, consider this. Most of these companies have grown incredibly quickly. So a lot of them have struggled to really find a corporate identity and a, uh, um, you know, a, a clear corporate culture. So, so these things tend to be a little bit in flux. And, and then when that does start to form, I mean, you know, they, they really do evolve in very, very different ways from each other. Yeah, now you use the phrase coming straight out of university. 
what if someone hasn't come out of university? What's their chances of actually getting a position at, you know, one of these firms we're kind of describing here? Um, is, uh, you know, is that one of the, one of the ways that employees uh, or potential employees actually filter applicants? It is, but only to an extent, right? So someone who has spent two years uh, you know, training to be an actuary, for example, could still be be highly suited for, for, for a junior trading type of role, you know, one of these large firms, right? You know, someone who, who has spent the last two years doing sales and marketing uh, might be less suited unless it's for the wholesale desk at a place like Optima, for example, and they speak 10 different languages. Um, you know, so I think that it really depends on what the candidate in question has done uh, with, with their time. I think that that's a very important thing. And then you know, the second most important thing, it's going to come back down to also that interest in trading. You know, I mean, what what is the motivation? In If someone asks you in an interview, why do you want to get into the industry? The, the correct answer is not, I want to get rich quick. I, you might, but <laughs> that shouldn't be the driving force. So I, I think a, a big part of it will depend on, on, on what someone's been doing with their time. Now, that being said, uh, these things do have a limited type of shelf life. Um, I think after three years, it does become a lot more difficult, right? So, so basically, I mean, you've got three years out of, out of school to go and figure out if you want to, to go in the trading direction or not. Um, and then if you do, you should have been doing something which at least has some sort of relevance, right? I mean, doesn't need to be relevance to trading, but, but utilizes some, some type of transferable skill. Right. This is something that, that, that we look at a lot, uh, transferable skills. So, um, you know, things that people do in, in other industries uh, or technologies that, that can maybe be applied to the trading world. And do you find, you know, just while we're talking about sort of coming out of university and that sort of thing, do you find that as someone might get older, it does really become much more difficult for them to land a position inside one of these firms? Yes. You know, within technology, not so. We get asked for technologists all the time, right? And uh, that there's such a big shortage of, of senior C++ developers and whatnot that, you know, I'll, we'll gladly take someone who's got 15 years of experience as long as they're good at C++ outside of the financial industry, right? So so that, that that's a very clear sort of difference. The same goes for for very heavyweight quants. I mean, some some really big quant funds like PDT Partners or Renaissance Technologies, you know, Renatech, um, but also Citadel, you know, and, and Two Sigma, AQR, they, they, they will take academics as well, right? I mean, they don't want people that have actually worked anywhere outside of university, right? But it's it's not unusual for them to hire a 45-year-old professor. So that that's another area. You know, within trading, you know, if you've spent, say, five years in an arcade doing purely manual type trading, then I think going to one of these firms and getting hired as a junior trader is going to be difficult, right? A better avenue to pursue might be to look at an execution type of role than maybe a hedge fund, right? So basically managing the hedge funds flow to the streets and stuff like that. I mean, that, that can be an awful lot of fun. And, and some hedge funds also uh, allow for sort of small sort of side pockets, you know, carve outs, books, um, you know, where the execution guys can also trade at their own discretion, right? Now, of course, these aren't the hundreds of millions that the PMs generally play around with and manage, but, uh, you know, I mean, a place like Millennium, it, it's not unusual for them to, to, to give the central dealing desk, you know, a five or ten million dollar carve out that, that they can put their own trades on, for example. So, for the most part, our conversation sort of revolved around how the would-be employee can get inside one of these firms. Let's talk about it from the other angle. So, you know, what do these firms do in an attempt to try and attract the best talent that they can and also keep that talent once they once they have them? Oh, gosh. Um, pretty much everything you could think of under the sun, right? Um, something the Americans are huge on is that, that employees should not be allowed to pay for any food, right? So, they, they have these massively... Stocked fridges, right? <laughs> I always find that 
that that's somewhat overkill. Um, you know, all these kind of perks, right? I mean, I've seen absolutely everything. I mean, DLW does yoga classes, wine tastings. Um, you know, uh, other firms take people to museums. You know, <laughs> days out on the town, uh, holidays. You know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's all nice, uh, but uh, the thing that drives most people when they when they get some experience ultimately is going to be fair compensation. Um, you know, uh, companies like like Tower Research and Alpha Grep and, and Jump Trading. I mean, they they all pay formulas, right? Um, big sort of international trading companies uh, like you know the, the Optivas of this world. They they pay discretionary bonuses. Um, you know, so that 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 is a big difference. Uh, I find that that the really successful traders would much rather have a clear cut, you know, cast an iron formula of their tr- trading profits than all the other perks on the side, right? Um, yeah. That being said, I mean, those perks are nice. I mean, and, uh, another very popular one that I've seen recently is the paternity leave, right? So, so you as the father get to take a month or two off, you know, to spend with your newborn. Um, I think there was one company that was even doing that. If you got a new dog, you get a, a month off to go and spend with your dog, you know, um, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. So it's, it, it's a long and, and, and varied list of, of things to entice people. Um, but the companies that, that do it best are the ones that pay the best, right? I mean, if you look at a, a fund like Rentec, which has basically the best performing hedge fund in the world, which is only open to the staff, right? You know, they have, pretty much zero staff turnover there. You know, if someone leaves, it's because they retire. Yeah, so I think ultimately hiring people, you know, enticing them to join is one thing, and the sort of cool perks can play a big role there. But keeping them, uh, you really do have to pay them. Yeah, and how much does the salary and the the compensation structures, how much does that like vary between place to place like first for an equal kind of role a comparable role at you know across the board does the pay vary greatly or is it fairly well balanced okay so i mean pay is generally composed out of, out of fixed pay right the base salary um you know the, these tend to be similar in in various geographies right so there can be quite big differences globally you know, I mean, the, uh, the, there was a time when down in Australia, people were getting a hundred thousand Aussie dollars, you know, and, and, and the Aussie in the U.S. were nearly one on one, whereas the starting salary in the U.S. would have been sixty, right? So, yeah, g- generally within the same sort of regions, you know, so Chicago is going to be a little bit lower than, than say New York or San Francisco or Austin, Texas, for example. I mean, those are generally the four sort of hubs in the U.S. You know. London used to be used to be quite competitive, but now post Brexit, of course, you know, with the pound versus the US a little bit lower. You know, continental Europe, in particular, Amsterdam is is probably not very competitive. Uh, neither is Germany. You know, Switzerland gets a bit better, so does Paris. You know, Hong Kong, it, it, it all tends to be quite similar. Singapore as well, Sydney as well, Tokyo as well. So that that's the base element. Now then, the variable part, right? Which of course is is the juicy bit that everyone is <laughs> is always chomping at the bit to know about. Um, yeah, th- th- this really depends the the type of platform and setup that you joined, right? So it's either a, a company that a large company that has a discretionary sort of bonus model, right? So um, th- these tend to be the big option market makers. So, so I think Optiver, IMC, Tibra, you know, for the former Timber Hill, but also Volant Trading, CTC, Wolverine, you know, Pick Six, all these kind of guys, right? They, they all have have that discretionary sort of sort of element. Other companies which have a a team based structure, so uh, Jump, Tower, Alpha Grep, uh, and, and a whole host of other ones, you know. That's a different kettle of fish because the, the team lead or leads have a deal with the company for a certain payout, and then they distribute that within the team. So there's generally more direction, right? And quite often, team members will also get a, a percentage written into the contract, right? So I mean, that might be ten percent or fifteen percent, or you know, um, you know. So so there can be big variation now. The the advantage, of course, in being in a big firm with a discretionary sort of sort of model 
is that when they have an absolutely knockout year like 2008, everyone gets paid a, a massive amount of money, right? Um, you know, that that's really great if you're, you're a sort of average kind of guy because then you'll get a lot more than, than you might have deserved. Uh, but, you know, some of the top performers might wind up getting, getting a bit less, you know, in an average sort of year. So they would have done a lot better at a place which does have a more structured uh, type of payout. When you talk about a discretionary payout, a discretionary model, can you just explain sort of what that means a little more? Okay. I'll give you an example of Optiva, right? So the way Optiva is structured is uh, a third of all the P&L after costs is attributable to staff bonuses and two-thirds is attributable to the shareholders, right? So if you, you want to make a lot of money in a place like that, you really need to be a shareholder. Now, that of that third... It's basically the management who decides who gets what. Now, there's a lot of factors that, that go into deciding that, right? Uh, trading performance, but also performance within the team. Uh, how helpful have you been? Have you contributed to projects? But also, you know, do you show up to work on time? Are you a pleasant guy to work with? I mean, all, all this kind of stuff, right? So, so discretionary, it, basically it means that you're going to find out what it is at the end of the year and, uh, you know, depending on where you are, that there, there could be a significant political element to that as well, right? Whereas if it's a percentage payout, which is contractually agreed, um, and certainly most hedge funds also have percentage payouts, right? I mean, that, that's also an interesting thing to note. Then you, you're going to know pretty much exactly what you're going to get, right? So the the discretionary payout is is something which, of course, has been long favoured by the banks as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that makes things a little clearer. That's good. So, just looking forward now, you know, to the future, a few questions around that. Um, I guess the first one would be, are there any roles which you used to hire for um, which pretty much no longer exist? Good question. I think that, that a lot of roles evolved over time. Believe it or not, that we do even still hire open outcry trading roles, right? I mean... Ultimately, big companies like, like IMC and Optima and, and CTC, I mean, they, they do need people in the trading pits as long as they're open in Chicago, right? Of course, these, uh, these are a lot less common, um, but it's, it's not the case that they've, they've vanished entirely. No, I think that, you know, if you take into, into consideration that certain positions may have evolved slightly or significantly over time, I, I don't think it's the case that, the that certain jobs have have completely disappeared, yeah. Just in general, right? I mean, if you take some very specific things like you know prop trading within the banks, of course, I mean that that did completely disappear for a while, right? And have you seen the amount of hiring decrease at all? Like as automation increases, has the amount of hiring decreased in any way, or? You know, maybe even if it's not due to automation, is there another factor um, which is affects the amount of hiring that takes place? Yes, yeah, so I've I've always associated hiring more with volumes traded rather than um, the extent of automation. You know, I mean, Virtu has a hard cap of 150 employees globally, right? So I mean, that's going to be very interesting to see what they do with KCG that have about a thousand. I mean, that's probably going to be a massive amount of layoffs, but. Uh, you know, uh, that, that that's a more unusual type of approach. What, what I tend to see is that, that hiring is driven very much by, by volumes first and then volatility second, right? So when, when volatility is high, everyone's looking for traders to take advantage of it. Uh, when volatility is low, everyone's looking for tech guys to basically try and you know, slit each other's throats with, with speed and latency, you know, and, and the latest microwave and radio frequencies and, uh, and all that jazz. You know, so, so, so the technology war sort of rages. Um, you know, and then when things are quiet and, and people find it more difficult to make money, you know, so when vol is low, so volatility and volumes are low, that, that's generally the kiss of death, right? So people start to, to downsize. I mean, that, that typically happens after a big market move. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that all your listeners 
I've seen many times that you know after a market tanks and crashes, you know, and then the volatility goes away, the volumes go away because everyone's lost all their money, and it just sort of lies down there, right? And then you know everyone sits around waiting for the next bull market to sort of happen. That that's very much a situation where where I would rather expect layoffs than anything else. Now, um, but that's within the the hedge fund and the prop trading world. Now, within the bank world. Yes, uh, increasing automation has led to less hiring uh, and will continue to. The reason for that is is that, you know, quite frankly, um, the banks are nowhere near as nimble or sophisticated as all the prop trading firms and the hedge funds. So you know these guys are way over staff still, and that there's a lot of dead wood that that can still be cut. You know, I foresee that that will continue. Uh, Going forward, I mean, especially with with new technologies like blockchain, you know, that might be able to to replace things like syndication, you know, and um, maybe even entire exchanges, you know, and dark pools and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think that that within the banks, you know, who are also under immense pressure to continue to cut costs by the shareholders, you know, it's all public companies. Uh, you know, it, it's much less. A factor of volatility or volumes, right? They're they're going to be cutting costs no matter what, right? If they if they have a knockout year, they'll th- they'll say thank you very much, that was great, but we're still going to try and try and squeeze every last penny we can out of it. Further moving forward, do you have any predictions for how how hiring might change? You know, I asked you earlier what sort of skills are most in demand right now, and you said, well, it's it's a constant moving target. Do you have any predictions for how hiring might change moving forward and any further developments in the industry? I think that, that you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence is is more than just a flavor of the month sort of thing. You know, I think that, that you are going to see an increasing shift there. Now, obviously, I understand that, that not everyone is, is, is going to go and study that, uh, and they shouldn't, right? Uh, but I, I do think that there's going to be increasing demand there um one thing which is always going to be in demand is is people who are good problem solvers right uh nobody's really interested in hiring a trader that has one strategy i mean I, i want to hire traders that have a track record of reinventing the wheel and coming up with new strategies you know as as markets become more competitive the the shelf life of trading strategies becomes shorter so what you want is someone who has the ability to, to, you know, and the energy to go out there and look for new and cool and interesting stuff, you know, and put it all together and make it happen. You know, not someone who, who has a strategy that makes a lot of money, but then when it stops working, sits around thinking, oh, you know, damn, well, what now, Sherlock? Right? So I think that, 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 that that's quite an important thing. Other things which, which I think will be more in demand this might sound sound a little odd. I I think people who who have a sort of keen sense of business development. Um, one thing which which I see lacking is the, the, the sort of natural wanderlust, you know, and and uh, desire to explore. Right. I mean, I, I I wish I saw more people come along and say, hey, you know, I've been trading this market; it works really well. But I want to try and apply it to different markets and. You know, or uh, I heard that there's some funky stuff going on down in Mexico, right? Because because Trump's rattling the sabers, and you know, can we go and trade that? You know, and apply our algos there, and you know, all this kind of stuff. You know, or can we can we move into new products? You know, what's going on in China? Uh, I think that that that's also becoming um, more and more of an increasingly important thing. Now, the reason for that is is that being competitive technology wise. To do that on a global scale has become pretty much impossible, right? That there is a reason that that Jump and KCG, you know, combined forces to to share microwave networks, you know, and, and that IMC has now invested in the McKay brothers, and so is Tower, and you know, it, you just can't really do it on your own. So what I'm seeing is a trend where companies will invest selectively for specific trades in specific markets. So, you know, the, the the way things have been going is that it's actually become more fragmented. So you have different companies, all different companies are fastest in different markets, right? So where I see 
the advantages for people is if you can basically take you know your your IP and your ideas and uh, and all that stuff and and then port it into new markets figure out if it works you know and then make the relevant investment just in that market you know i mean it, you don't need to to have global colo right i mean it only needs to be in 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 the markets where 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 you want to be competitive right that's where you want to have colo and, and have a microwave connection if uh, if possible you know so so that 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 sort of desire to explore i i think is is certainly something which, which i would like to see more of you know i think that's really cool to get your insight on that you know, just to take us out here, is there any, I guess, final words, final bits of wisdom you'd like to pass on? Anything that might be helpful for particularly people trying to get into junior roles? Is there anything you'd like to share which might be helpful for them? Demonstrate passion. Think carefully about, about answers that you give. Don't don't say negative things about teachers or, or former employers, stuff like that. It, it's all pretty basic, you know. It's um, you think before before you act, and at the end of the day, people will hire you because they think that you're going to be successful and, and make them an awful lot of money, right? Um, but they don't necessarily want to hear that, that you, <laughs> you want to be a millionaire you know, before the age of thirty, and, and that's why they should hire you. Yeah, it's. Uh, <sighs> Nothing really out of the ordinary, I suppose, and I, I would think that all of this is it's really rather obvious. Although, although you'd be surprised, I mean, <laughs> the sort of answers that people give in interviews. You know, uh, and at the end of the day, I mean, just be yourself, you know. But it's, I think, one thing that I, I would really recommend, if possible, do mock interviews. Right? I mean, so many people lose out on jobs just because they perform poorly in interviews, and also on on, on tests, right? Be it arithmetic tests or programming tests. Yeah, interviewing is the same thing. Practice makes perfect, right? And it, there's no shame in, in not doing a good interview if it's the first one you've ever done, right? Because you haven't had any practice. What do you mean by doing mock interviews? Like what's an example of that? How, how can you do a mock interview? Look up a bunch of interview questions on Glassdoor. Uh, get one of your mates to, to, to basically pretend to be the interviewer, tell them to be devil's advocate and just go through the motions. Yeah, right, right. Now, that's really good advice, really sound advice, Matthew. If anyone listening to this wants to find out a bit more about yourself and what you do, where is the best place they should go to? Our website is, is matthewhoyle.com. That's M-A-T-T-H-E-W-H-O-Y-L-E.com. Uh, that's probably the best place to go. You can, uh, you can basically just leave a message on the website. Uh, I'm also happy for people to email me directly. Uh, my email is very straightforward. It's, it's matthew.hoyle at matthewhoyle.com. So M-A-T-T-H-E-W dot H-O-Y-L-E at matthewhoyle.com. Um, you know, and then, and then we can take it from there. I mean, we, there's a whole bunch of us here in the office. So <laughs> there's a, a lot of people looking to fill a lot of positions. So we're always happy to hear from people. Very good. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Matthew. This has been hugely interesting for me. I mean, we've covered a lot of new ground that we've not previously talked about on the podcast. So um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, man. Thank you very much. Likewise, Aaron. I, I certainly enjoyed it myself as well. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I wish you all the best. It's, uh, it's a great show that you're doing. Thanks a lot. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.